Father in heaven, uh, thank you. We've had a, a really great Sabbath, and we just want to give you a big thank you. It's all because of you. Um, none of this would be possible without you. Everyone here who is interested in spiritual things uh, is here because of you. And we ask that you would bless us one more time, that you would please indeed send us your spirit, uh, teach us this evening, and Lord, give us, uh, give us keys to revival. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in your opinion, what is the church's most urgent need? What is the church's most urgent need? Prayer. Prayer? Very good. Excellent. What are some other, some other ideas? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit uh, Bible? Revival. 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 Oh, all right. Someone read my sermon notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let me just read to you. Those are all very great answers. In a way, they're all the, the correct answer. Uh, Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1887. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. Listen. To seek this should be our first work. First work. Um, when a church wants to um, understand how to do effective evangelism, really they need to start here. They need to start at revival. This is the, the basis for any good evangelism as a church is revival. The better the revival, the better the evangelism. And I have seen churches, I've been part of evangelistic efforts where you work so hard and it's like all this work for this like teeny little results. And then I've seen uh, evangelistic efforts where the church does very little and just this huge influx, this great outpouring. Mm -hmm. And the difference is, is how, how much revival there is, how much uh, the church is able to receive what God is trying to give them. It's, it's tremendous. God is the one who's got the faucet, you know, who's got the, his hand on the nozzle as to how much outpouring we get. And so uh, it all starts with revival. And so um, I'm going to be sharing the third. Well, I shared my testimony last night, but the third today in, in three steps of how to initiate revival, how to ignite, ignite a revival in our churches. We talked this morning about hungering and thirsting, that we need to kick that Laodicean lie that we're okay and we need to start crying out to God to help us to hunger and thirst. Help us to want it. Help, give us the capacity to receive it. And then the talk after that, I spoke about how we need to show God, ask God to show us what are the sins that are standing in the way of us personally receiving a large measure of the Holy Spirit. But there's a third thing that needs to happen. A third thing that we need to do, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. I hope you have your Bibles. If not, I hope you have a phone. Please turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. If not, I'm going to read it and you can just listen to me. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. And we're going to see something that pops up over and over. Acts 1, 14. All right. I'll go ahead and get started. Forgive me if I'm starting too early. It says, and this is all the apostles plus the 120 are in the upper room. It says, all these continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. Notice it says, all these continued with one what? Accord. With one accord. Okay, check out chapter 2 and verse 1. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with what? One accord in one place. All right, look at verse 46, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. It says, Acts 2, 46, And they continuing daily with one what? Accord. One accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness, of, with gladness and singleness of heart. And then two more times in the next two chapters, one accord. Five times in the first few chapters of Acts, one accord, one accord, one accord, one accord, one accord. Do you think God's trying to say something? Yes. Yeah. Unity is huge when it comes to revival and receiving the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see this is not just a message from the book of Acts. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 and verse 16. Romans chapter 12 and verse 16. Okay. 
I think I'm going to stop saying turn with me. I'm going to start saying dial with me, too. Because <laughs> uh, you don't hear as many turning pages as the years go on as I, as I travel. I'm not hating on phones. I'm just saying that's just the way things are going. Um, anyhow. Romans 12, 16. It says, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but consent, condescend to men of low estate. Don't be wise in your own conceits. Did we see the unity concept again? Amen. Be of one mind. Have the same mind. Notice also uh, chapter 15, same book, Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. Romans 15, verse 5 and 6. It says, Now the God of patience and of consolation grants you to be, notice, like-minded one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one what? One mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just read to you, uh, for the sake of time, 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of peace will, shall be with you. Amen. I can give you several other verses. Over and over and over, the teaching of the apostles, the example of the book of Acts, is the church must have unity. Unity is one of those last factors that gives God the green light to pour out His Holy Spirit. God cannot pour out His Holy Spirit while we have division. Division is weakness. Unity is strength. I have a really encouraging message for you, though. Did you know the Bible says it will happen? It will happen. Let me just read to you Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. I'll paraphrase it. It's talking about the gifts that God gives to His church. You know the passage, and He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as teachers. And that tells us what gifts He gave. The next verse tells us why He gave them. For the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints. So all those gifts, it's so that we could be built up. We could become like Christ. The next verse after that, verse 13, tells us how long we will need these gifts till. And it says, until we come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So Paul's predicting we'll need all these ministries until the church is one. And they will have accomplished their purpose. Jesus in John 17, in his uh, intercessory prayer to his father, he said, Lord, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Amen. You know, it's one of the things that's going to convince all these atheists and, you know, all these different religions that Jesus was a real person. He was the actual Son of God. He came. He died for their sins. When they say unity in the church, when they say unity in the church, it's going to be the miracle of all miracles. And this is something that needs to happen. We need to be in one accord like the early church before God pours out His Holy Spirit. So, I like to talk about unity and, um, I'd just like to be very honest with you. I think as a, as a denomination, we're struggling with unity. We struggle with unity. And anyone who's kind of paying attention, I think, can um, understand that. We have some churches that view things a certain way, and they all get together in their churches. And then we have other churches that view things a different way, and they all get together. And more frequently than we'd like to admit, perhaps, they don't like each other. And they don't talk well about each other. And uh, th I've traveled the whole country. I've traveled to different countries speaking and preaching. It's the same thing everywhere I go. It's the same thing. And I think one of the things that's contributing to this, uh, this lack of unity, this division in the church, is the way we actually talk and think about each other. Let me explain that. I'm going to do an illustration here in a minute. Have you ever heard someone say something like, um, you know... God bless sister so-and-so, but she's a little bit too liberal. She's a little far left, you know? Or have you ever heard someone say, you know what, brother so-and-so, God bless him. A wonderful guy, but you know, he's, he's a bit too conservative. Kind of ultra, you know, too far to the right. I know you guys have never said anything like that, of course. But, but you know, have you ever heard of anyone, you know, have you ever been in a conversation and you heard someone say something like that? Happens all the time. Happens all the time. Um, I'd like to share with you that I think um, 
this type of thinking is, is detrimental overall to us as a church, even the way we think and the way we talk. And let me show you some really serious pitfalls with this way of, this way of talking and thinking. I'll leave that here. Uh, okay. So thankfully the folks that I'm staying with up there, they had a yardstick, which is perfect. So let's pretend this is the spectrum theologically of Seventh-day Adventists. And I brought these all the way from Lake Tahoe just to show this to you so you can feel very special now. <laughs> and let's say, let me make sure I get this right. All right, so this is what we would call the people on the left. Ooh, I might run into some technical issues here. This is what we would call the people on the far right. And guess who we have smack in the middle, the perfect blend of both of these values? We have Jesus who is the perfect balance of these two spectrums. Let me see if I can use my Bible to... Oh, cool. That's the thing that's going to work. All right. And so we have people who are really far on the left here, people who are really far on the right, and then we got all these gradients in between, right? And I think there's probably things we could all agree on like that are way too far this way and there's things we could probably all agree on that are way too far that way but as we start kind of getting closer to the center then we kind of start falling into pieces and we start breaking off into different groups and different points of views and things like that now I'm going to show you an inherent several inherent faults with this idea of saying you know brother sister brother so and so he's a little too far to the right sister so and so she's a little too far to the left when you, when you make that statement, when you say, sister so-and-so is too far to the left, too far to the left of who? Who's the frame of reference? You. You. Too far to the left of you. You're the frame of reference. And where are you assuming you are on the spectrum? <laughs> Just be honest. Right here, huh? You're assuming you're center. That, that's the thing. We all assume we're in the center. None of us is going around and saying, you know what, brother so-and-so, he's balanced. Me, no, I'm a wild fanatic, man. I'm, I'm crazy. Yeah, I got crazy theology. None of us think that way. We all think we're in the center. All of us, without fail. But, boy, wouldn't you say that's a pretty generous assumption? Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you, have you ever... Um, grown in your walk with Christ and you modified your point of view on something. Maybe you modified your behavior in a certain area because God gave you more light, God gave you more information, and you, you used to do this, but you stopped, you were convicted, and you started doing that. Or you didn't do this before, and you started doing something else. Has anyone had that experience where, where you grew in your relationship with the Lord? I, I have. The way I practice my Christianity today is not the way I was practicing it the first year uh, I, I was converted. I've grown, and it should be that way. Do you think you're done with that journey? I highly doubt that any of us are, are done with that journey. So since we have grown in the past, we're probably still going to be growing in the future. We may be making some modifications to how we apply our faith. Amen? So therefore, we're probably not in the center and don't you think that's pretty safe to assume? We're probably not in the scepter. But when you make the statement, they're too far to the right, they're too far to the left, we're assuming that we're, boom, smack in the middle. What, in, what, what a very generous assumption we're making about ourselves. Now, check this out. What if you're actually, mm, let's say you're, 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 you think you're here, but you're actually here. Like, from the way heaven views you, in reality, you're there. And you say, you know what? This is uh, brother so-and-so. Brother so-and-so, he's, you know, he's a little bit too conservative. He's a little too far to the right. Remember, too far to the right of you. So, if you're actually here and brother so-and-so is a little too far to the right, where does that put brother so-and-so? Ooh. Maybe brother so-and-so is actually here. Or maybe he is a little bit too far to the right, but he's still actually closer to Jesus than you are. 
So think about this. When we make a statement like that, we could actually be judging somebody who's closer to Christ than we are. Just because we're basing the assumption that we're dead in the center. But what if we're not? And we're probably not. We're probably not. But there's still more growth for me to do and probably for you to do as well. So that's one inherent flaw that we have with this whole concept. The second one is what this whole thing doesn't take into account is sincerity. This doesn't take into account sincerity. So is it possible that you could have someone, let's say they're, they're, they're really close, like just somehow they've, they understand scripture really well, they, they got the lifestyle thing down, the, the way they apply the principles of scripture, but they do not have a love for God. Is it possible that someone have all the right standards and that in their heart be far from Jesus? Yes or no? Absolutely. Yeah, it's possible. Now let me ask you, is it also possible that someone, let's say they're over here, they got all kinds of worldly things in their life and, you know, they're, they're just stuff that's just not right. But they were just converted yesterday and they're sincere as the day is long. Is that possible? Yeah. Absolutely. I've been there. there. If you had met me in the first few months after my conversion, you would have been like, what kind of music is this guy listening to? You might have heard me slip up and say a curse word or two. I mean, I... I wasn't perfect. You know, I, was, I loved Jesus passionately, but I was still growing. And I shed things really fast. I changed the way I did things. Whenever God would show me something, boom, it was, I changed. Because I, I, I loved Jesus, and I just wanted to serve Him exactly how He wanted me to serve Him. But I had a lot of worldly things in my life, and God had to shed those. And so, here's another problem. Maybe you got it right. Maybe this is you. And you're looking at this brother and saying, man, lots of worldly stuff. But from heaven's point of view, this person loves Jesus way more. So that's another inherent problem. This doesn't take into account sincerity. Someone could be sincere and still have a lot of false theology. They could be sincere and have, you know, some wrong practices. That's entirely possible. Because we don't know what light they have or have not been exposed to. All right. So, um, and generally speaking, another problem with this is I just find that it tends to drive us apart. It puts us in camps. It, it, it tends to cause more division than unity. Now, you might be thinking, well, so do we just kind of pretend that we're all in unity when the fact is we're not, we're all very divided? No, I'm not saying that at all, and I'm going to address that in a little bit. But I want to talk about why, why do we even think this way? Why, why do we even have this, this issue? And I want to share real quick so, an insight that God gave me. So the Bible's full of instructions, full of instructions for life. Those instructions are largely divided into two categories. The first would be precepts, and the second is principles. What's the first one? Precepts. And the second one is principles. Okay. A precept is something that's very black and white. It's very specific. It's very clear. Let me give you an example of a precept. Thou shalt not commit adultery. See any gray area there? No. Very specific. Very clear. Timeless. But then we have principles. Let me share a principle with you. In whatsoever you eat, or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's very broad. That could be applied very differently in different places. What you know, country you're living in, what your social economic status is, what light you have. There's a lot of different ways that principle can be applied. And there is uh, what you might call, there's, there's gray area in that. That might look different based on who it is, where they are, and so forth. Okay, the, the, pre, the precepts, there's not a lot of arguing about the precepts. They're so clear, right? The principles, the gray area, that's where all the fighting happens. That's where all the disagreement and the tension generally takes place in the church. And so when I realized this, the immediate next question I had is, well, Lord, then why did you allow there to be any gray area? You know, if I had written the Bible, you know what I would have done? A list of precepts. I mean, zero gray area. I mean, cut and dry. You know, this is righteousness. This is sin. If you do this, you're good. If you do that, you're bad. I mean, just like a manual for life. I would have eliminated all gray area if I wrote the Bible. But 
someone much wiser than me didn't write the Bible that way. Amen. And I had to ask myself, why? Why, Lord, why did you allow there to be that gray space? Because that's where all the fighting is. And if you take the gray space away, you take the fighting away, right? And God helped me to understand something. What he helped me to understand is that God has intentionally allowed for gray spaces in Scripture because the gray spaces reveal our hearts. The gray spaces reveal deep what's inside of our hearts. And it's in the gray spaces that God is testing us. The gray spaces is where God is testing us. Trivia question. Jesus was asked, Master, Rabbi, what's the greatest commandment in the law? What do you say the first one was? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. And what did he say the second one was? Very good. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love other people. So love God, love your neighbor. The gray spaces test both of these commandments in our hearts. They test both of these areas. Let me explain. How does it test our love for God? Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you're in a conversation with about five or six people, and you have a loved one that's right next to you, someone you really love. Let's say it's mom. Everyone loves mom, right? It's your mom. And there, it's a really fun conversation. People are cracking jokes. We're laughing. And then a joke pops in your head. And you think, oh, this joke would fit in just perfect with this conversation. But then you stop and think, but you know what? This joke has a 50% chance of offending and possibly even embarrassing mom. Do you tell the joke yes or no? No. No. Why? Because you, you love mom, right? And you don't want to offend or embarrass her. So love always errs on the side of caution. Love always errs on the side of caution. And what we're doing in the gray spaces, where we're erring, is testing our love for God. What we're doing with the health message. What we're doing with different lifestyle standards. Where we go. The words we choose to use. The clothes we wear. How we wear them. All of these things. God, you know, there's not Bible verses that say the skirt needs to be this high off the ground. Or this is the exact way your tie needs to be tied. There, we can't find scriptures that tell us that. And that's intentional. Because God wants you to see what's in your heart based on how you apply those principles. Amen. Now, it's not letting God know. God knows already. It's to let you know. It's to let you know what's in your heart. God is testing us in the gray spaces and how in, in our relationship with Him. It's how we love each other. How do we treat people that draw the line at different places? How do we treat people that draw the line at different places? You know, it's really funny. As I was putting this um, message together, I went on Facebook because I posted a YouTube video on Facebook and I needed to take care of some work stuff. And when I went on Facebook, the first thing I saw was a post from someone within the church and they were promoting a teaching that I really disagree with. And I really think is actually quite divisive and has not borne good fruit in our denomination. Do you know what was the first thing that leapt out of my heart? Anger. Anger. I, 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 it was just such a blatant, bold post. The first thing that went through my head was, how dare you post this error and expose all these Adventists to this teaching? How dare you confuse the flock? How dare you, you know, throw this division? You, you know this is a divisive issue and you're, you're pushing it anyways. And you know, the Holy Spirit stopped me. He said, Gabriel, what, what, what sermon were you working on just a minute ago? I thought, wow, you've got to be kidding me. I, I saw very clearly. And you know, God said, you don't have to agree with this person, but you need to love them. Amen. You have to love this person. If you're correct theologically and you don't love this person, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whatsoever. And I thought, wow, thank you, Lord. I, 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 really, I really needed that. Because I've been... Um, I've been very zealous for the faith, you know? I've been a very ardent defender of the truth, and that has taken me places that have not been good many times. It's good to have zeal. The Bible says we need to have zeal. It says be zealous and repent. That's what God tells the Laodicea. But that zeal can cross a line, and it can turn into hatred. It can turn into anger. It can turn into bitterness. It can turn into division. And that's not going to bring one accord in the church. Um share a few thoughts here. I actually believe that it's 
God has ordained it to be part of the sanctification journey for us to share spaces with people who relate differently to church standards than you and I do and to not be irritated by it. I believe God has intentionally allowed for that so that we can be tested. How do we relate to people that have different political views that we just cannot identify with? Can we share that space? Can we love that person? Can we pray with that person? Work with that person? And hope and pray that one day we're going to have the same point of view. And trust, as we get closer to Jesus, we're going to get closer together doctrinally as well. Part of becoming Christ-like is learning to coexist with people that don't see things exactly the same way that we do. Can anyone say marriage? Hello? I mean, that's marriage right there. You, you, you know, you... These people, you know, I mean, there were times where my wife, I just, I just could not understand how she understood things and saw things, but she was very sincere in her convictions, and as well as I was in mine, but she had a very different mind as I did, and we had to love each other. Um, I want to bring up, just briefly, a bit of a hot topic, a hot potato issue. We all know what happened the last, you know, two, three years ago, covid Vaccine mandates, masks, all these things. You know, it was really surprising for me. I, honestly, it was a really revealing situation. There were people who I thought, oh, these people are going to be totally against the, you know, against vaccinations. And they were for it. I was like, whoa. And then there were people like, oh, they're going to be for the vaccination for sure. They're like, I'm not taking that thing, man. I was like, I, it, was, it was really revealing. I was, I was pretty surprised. But how did we treat each other? All you need is a Facebook account with a few dozen Adventist friends on there, and you saw how we treated each other. We didn't always play nice in the sandbox. And um, honestly, whether we, you got vaccinated or not really is besides the issue. How we treated each other, I think, was the greater issue. And I asked God, why did you even allow COVID to come into the church? Why did you allow all that stress and that difficulty? I'll, I'll give you my opinion. I can't give you a thus saith the Lord on this. This is Gabe's opinion. I think God was testing our love. I think God was testing our love. There's probably more to the story than that, but I think that was one of the reasons why God allowed that. And so punchline number one, here's point number one of this message. God is testing our love for Him and each other with the gray spaces. With the gray spaces. Um, so, what do we do? Do we ignore the fact that some Adventists have very different doctrinal stances than other Adventists. No, we, we can't ignore that. We really actually need to come into unity. Here's the thing. Here's punchline number two. I'm going to give it to you immediately. I believe we come into unity of doctrine by first coming into unity of heart. We come into unity of doctrine by first coming into unity of heart. Um, we get in trouble when we try and get unity of doctrine before we have unity of heart. Because when I don't feel close to you, it's very easy for me to disrespect you. It's very easy for me to argue with you and just let you go on your way and, hey, you're going to be lost. I hope you figure it out with God. It's, but when I love you, it's harder for me to do that. It's harder for me to do that with someone that I love. We come into unity of doctrine. I think the way we're all going to come together and eventually work this thing out Amen. is by coming, having unity of heart first. And the unity of doctrine will happen. Um, how do I know this is the case? Because this isn't the first time this has happened. You know, we don't have to recreate the wheel. God has done this before. He did this with the 12 apostles. Let me share with you just two of the 12 apostles. Let me start with um, Levi Matthew. Who knows? What was Levi Matthew's uh, profession prior to being called to a disciple? He was a tax collector. And as a tax collector, he was a Jew. But who was he actually working for? The Romans. Okay. So we have a guy who's into, into big taxes. He's into big government. And then Jesus went to a party at Matthew's house. And according to the Pharisees, he had some friends that were kind of into some loose living. Yeah. On this political spectrum, where would you place Levi Matthew? Which side? <laughs> He's over here. He's on the left. Big government, big taxes, loose living. Levi was a liberal. Did you know it says in Desire of Ages that the disciples were floored? Well, it doesn't use that exact terminology, but I'm paraphrasing. They were floored when Jesus called Levi. They were like, what? This guy's going to be part of us? Like, he's so different than us, theologically. Like, Okay, so we got Levi over here. 
And we have another gentleman over here. His name was Simon Zelotes. Simon Zelotes or Simon the Zealot. Who knows what, what that meant, Simon the Zealot, who the Zealots were? They were against the Roman government. Okay. They, they to fight and die for the, their cause. That's right. Both of you. Uh, exactly. They were a political movement that started during the Greek occupation, during the time of the Maccabees. And they were very pro-Israel. They were very nationalistic. They were very, don't tread on me. They were, and if they needed to, they would resort to violence to make sure that Israel's rights were respected. Small government, super, you know, very national. Let's take up, let's take up arms if we need to. Where would you put Simon the Zealot on this political spectrum if he had to? Right. Yeah, he would be a proud boy. Today, Simon Zealot would be a part of the Proud Boys. And uh, yeah, he was a far right. He would, he, he's a very strong Second Amendment individual, except they didn't carry. He was a very pro, pro sword. <laughs> he was pro swords, pro daggers. And some of the zealots would actually carry daggers with them everywhere they went. They were like, hey, if we, if we got to be violent, that's what we need to do. We need to stand up for Israel's rights. We have rights as a people. And so we have Simon the Zealot, we have Levi and Matthew, part of the same group of disciples. And what did we read in Acts 1.14? And they were together with one accord. A miracle. When you recognize the diversity, and we haven't talked about Peter, we haven't talked about the Sons of Thunder, we haven't talked about Doubting Thomas. I mean, you had the full political spectrum just within the 12. Who knows who comprised the 120? It could have been even, even more diverse than that. But you had the full political spectrum, just like we have in our church. And yet we find in Acts chapter 114, they were in one accord. Let us, uh, I'm going to read that passage one more time. And notice a key thing here. It says, these all continued with one accord. Here's the key. In prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know what's part of coming into one accord? By praying together. Praying together is a huge part of how we're going to pull this diverse church together. Also, uh, working together, studying the Bible together, those things as well. But prayer is kind of what I want to focus on here. Let me share with you. I'm just going to read a few quotes. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here in a second. This isn't going to be a very long talk. Um, but I just wanted to share, uh, share these quotes before I finish. Evangelism, page 111. It says, the blessing of the Lord will come to the church members who thus participate in the work. Gathering, notice, gathering in small groups daily to pray for its success. Thus the believers will obtain grace for themselves and will work, and the work of the Lord will be advanced. Who wants to see the work of the Lord advanced through South Center, South Center Church? Amen. This, I just, we were just told by inspiration how to do that. By um, small groups daily to pray for its success. Notice, uh, Review and Herald, July 24, 1883. That those who love the Lord and His truths unite by twos and threes and seek places of retirement and pray for God's blessing. Notice, upon the minister who can hardly find time to pray because he is constantly engaged in attending so many requests. So, Multiple places in the spirit of prophecy, it says we should get together twos, threes, just to pray for specific individuals. You could pray for more than one person, but especially our pastors who have to deal with so much. Last quote. No, second to last quote. The church must arouse to action. The Spirit of God, listen, can never come until she prepares the way. There should be earnest searching of heart. There should be united, persevering prayer, and through faith, claiming the promises of God. Again, united, persevering prayer, claiming God's promises. That's how we're going to receive the Spirit, guys. Last quote. It's the Bible plan for a group of people to and study His Word for light. Short and sweet. It's the Bible plan for God's people to pray together and study His Word for light. Um, as we close here, as a church, I don't think I really have to inform you. We struggle with unity. And as we look, we see there's inherent flaws and challenges with looking at people and thinking they're a little bit too far to the left, they're a little bit too far to the right. Because what are we assuming about ourselves? We're that we're in the center. And that's a pretty big assumption. <laughs> 
Also, this doesn't say anything about sincerity, does it? We could be judging people more sincere to, than us. And if we're off and we're judging someone saying, hey, they're a little bit too far, we could actually be judging people that are closer to Jesus than us. So even the way we think, the way we talk about each other, people at other churches, people in different conferences, whatever, it affects the way we feel about them and the way we view them and the way we view our churches. And God is wanting to change that. We're going to have people who are part of God's class, last day group that are going to be like Levi Matthew. And we're going to be like, man, you're too far left. But you know what? You're part of this group. Let's pray. Let's work. Let's love each other. And let's trust that we're going to fulfill Acts 1.14. We're going to come together somehow. We're going to have people that are like Simon the Zealot. Like, man, this guy's ready to bring a gun to church. You know, he's, <laughs> this brother's ready to stand up and, you know, make this thing happen. But you know what? Let's come together. Let's work together. Let's love each other. Let's pray. Let's God. Let God work this out. Um, I've recognized this and um, the need for this. And so at the church I'm working with right now in South Lake Tahoe, we have five prayer meetings. Five. There's one we do every uh, five days a week, every morning. It's over the phone at 7 a.m. There's one we do for our Nevada church members, Wednesday night. And then there's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night at 5 p.m. at the church prayer meeting. Why? Because we recognize that we, and trust me, this spectrum exists in my church back in South Lake Tahoe. We have people over here, and we have people over here. But I'll tell you, God is doing something amazing. There's almost zero bickering. It's really interesting. It's a very unique situation. And I chalk up a lot of it to the fact that we are praying a lot as a church. We pray together. We work together. We study together. There's little, you know, squirmishes here and there. I told you about one I had last night with, another, with one of the church members. But we're working together. We love each other. We're, we're trying to press together. This is something that has to happen in all of our churches, friends. And as we form more and more unity, God is going to see a big green light. And he's going to say, it's time to send my Holy Spirit. When we show him unity, he's going to honor that with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Just like the apostles who are of one accord. And so what I encourage everyone to do, if you're not part of a prayer meeting at your church, do your utmost to become part of a prayer meeting. Or maybe start your own prayer meeting. There's nothing wrong with... Maybe the church does it Wednesday night, but you, you're you working Wednesday night. Start one at your house Thursday night. Start one at your house Friday night. It didn't say we need like a whole group of people. It said twos and threes. At some times at our prayer meetings, it's me and another you know, old lady at the church, you know, and I, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes it's six people, and that's awesome. But sometimes it's a, it's a really small group. And I read this, I'm like, that's okay. Twos or threes, that's fine. You never, you're never going to get the whole church. Start with a small group. Pray together. Plead for God to bring us into unity. And God will do something special with your church. Does that make sense, you guys? Amen. All right. Let's bow our heads together. Let's close. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we want to say thank you for, um, for putting up with us. Thank you for loving us, though we think very differently than you do sometimes, and we act very differently than you do sometimes. Help us to give each other the grace that you have given us. Help us to love each other, and help us to love other people that draw the line at different places. Help us to love the people in church whose minds we can't relate to. Help us to not be antagonistic towards them. Help us to draw together as much as possible. And Lord... Help us to pray together. Bring us together to pray. Unite our hearts. Sort out our doctrinal differences, Lord. Sort out this church. You know this church has a, a wide variety of, of views on doctrines, and it's not good. It is not to your glory. You're going to bring us into one accord someday before you pour out your Holy Spirit. Help each and every person here to be part of that. And part of how we do that, Lord, is you've told us to get together and to pray. Help us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.